Um, yep. So I would want to quickly move on to uh, the different spices that is, you know, the whole spice and then you have powdered spice and you have semi ground, you know, something like that. So um, a, I, I really want you to emphasize on, you know, the, uh, the oxidation and right. what's the, you know, the point of uh, storing these masalas in boxes. Right. And also, yeah. when do we add these spices? Like, um, you know, whole spices have to be added in the beginning of cooking. So right. why do we add them? Yes. Why, why, do we, why, do, why are certain spices added at the beginning of um, the cooking process? And some of them are added right. towards the end of the cooking practice. Right. So the, all the magic of a, of a spice, uh, especially, I think it depends on what, if you're talking about fresh spices like a ginger, garlic, et cetera, or herbs, it's a different mm -hmm. thing. You're talking about dried spices, be it dried herbs or like dry seeds of, or, you know, the, the, the dried whole spices, uh, where mm -hmm. all the, you know, all the really strong aromas happen, right? Um, it's literally about 5% of that entire mass of your spice. Uh, that is, uh, that's where all the magic happens. That's where what we call the essential oils. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, you know, essential oils, they're not fats, by the way, they're mostly could be all kinds of things. They're halidides, aldehydes, ketones, I mean, it's a whole bunch of things, but we still call them essential oils simply because they're extracted you know, from that and so on. I think with the exception of clove, which tends to have a very high percentage of essential oil, like, like nine, 10% uh, uh, and so on. And that, and, and eugenol, which is that molecule, which is the, the fundamental the flavor profile of uh, clove is also a, a lovely painkiller, which is why we kind of use it to, uh, you know, uh, number, yeah. you know, tooth, toothaches and so on, right? Yep. So the essential flavor molecules of spice, typically most uh, most spices will have three or four predominant ones and hundreds of other minor ones that are too small for you to notice. Uh, that kind of characteristically kind of make up the, the flavor of that spice, right? So, you know, eugenol for clove and, you know, uh, saffronol for uh, saffron and, and cinnamaldehyde for cinnamon and so on, right? So they, mm -hmm. so I sort of, there's that table in the book that kind of tells you what are the primary flavor molecules. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, curry leaf has a sulfurous uh, primary flavor molecules. Uh, and, you know, part of the reason you know, we, we call it curry leaf is because the uh, uh, Tamil word uh, for, Tamil word for meat gravy is curry, that, you know, historically, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so uh, the curry leaf, at some point of time, uh, sort of people who uh, who are today vegetarians, uh, we were all meat eaters for most part. Um, and then, you know, for religious and other, you know, impact of Buddhism and Jainism, others became vegetarian and so on. Uh, so there were a lot of, of culinary innovations to deal with the fact that you're now not eating meat. Um, and to bring about those same flavors and so on, we started using things like asafoetida, uh, more ginger, onion, garlic, and curry leaves because mm -hmm. sulfurous flavors are meaty and savory in nature. Uh, and they kind of give you, lend that sort of meaty flavor uh, to what would otherwise be plant dishes that don't have uh, the flavor of meat and so on, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so essentially uh, the, the thing here is, is about very simple. The idea is to extract those essential oils of those spices uh, and have them dissolve in your fat, whatever you're using. So you're starting with some oil or ghee or whatever it is, you want to get those flavors. And that's why all Indian cooking starts with some kind of fat and you throw in spices into that, right. whole spices into that, right? Now with heat, you are essentially then extracting the those oils and dissolving them into the fat. And then that flavored oil in your, uh, this thing is, is what is giving the entire flavor of the dish, right? The vegetables or the other themselves don't have much flavor. All of the flavors literally coming from this. And it's mostly aroma for most part, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Not so much taste, okay? Now, um, so again, the whole idea is that if you use the whole spice, uh, you need to give it a lot more time uh, for it to release all of the oils into the, into the fat, right? Powdered spices, uh, on the other hand, uh, one, the moment you're damaging it, all those, uh, those uh, those molecules are uh, aromatic, yes. Uh, why is it aromatic? Because they're volatile, right? If it's not volatile, it's not aromatic. I mean, you can only smell it if the molecule literally travels to your nose. So if right. it's not volatile, it's not aromatic, right? So so therefore, with time, it's going to lose smell. Uh, and uh, so that what happens to spice powders is that they just sit and oxidize in your oxidize. kitchen shelf and turn into sand very, very quickly, right? Now, historically, it's actually quite fascinating. Uh, the use of spice powders uh, is very new. Uh, it's a it's a colonial time introduction, right? Uh, uh, historically, we would only take whole spices and use like a mortar and pestle to grind them. Uh, and mortar and pestle is a very gentle way of grinding, uh, of uh, of extracting the oils and not lose too much of it uh, uh, to to the air. On the other hand, a, a fast spinning mixie or a blender or a spice uh, grinder and so on. Uh, 
is spinning so fast at 3000 4000 rpm is generating a ton of heat uh, the very act of grinding you lose a lot of aroma right mm. so it's an interesting trick if you're actually making like a green chutney for example uh, like say you know mint and coriander and chilies and you know you, so the chutney you make for chaat and you know things like that right uh, because the and mint is such a sensitive very aromatic uh, flavor uh, though if you grind it you're going to lose a lot of the flavor uh, mm. uh, to, uh, because of the heat and so on so a common trick is actually put a ice cube uh, that will lower the temperature and at that lower temperature you're going to lose less of the uh, the aroma when you actually grind uh, things like these chutneys and so on so so therefore uh, I, it is just that uh, uh, spice powders were actually introduced by the british uh, of for a convenience okay. standpoint because it was easier for them to transport it transport it uh, and so on but uh, historically i think you know whole spices is, is how we almost always cooked uh, and now obviously we have a very hybrid approach right so we use whole spices at the start and then powdered spices at the end in general right now often i think common misconceptions uh, one is that people think spices need to be cooked they don't uh there is no such thing as cooking of spices the only activity you are interested in is in taking the ex- essential oils out of the spices and dissolving them into the fat which therefore means if you are adding any spice directly to water okay mm-hmm. you are you have to ask yourself what is it that you are ex- exactly doing other than reducing its aroma the longer you cook because it does not dissolve in water and so if you add a ton of spice powder you want to bring it down to a mild level by the end of the cooking process if that is your goal yes by all means add one tablespoon of dhania powder at the start of the process by the end of the process you'll be left with a mild dhania flavor or add a quarter teaspoon right at the end and you'll literally get the same effect right mm. so this is again i think it's a common sort of misconception that people have that you have to cook spices you don't have to cook spices right uh, the 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 raw smell that sometimes you get because you added powders at the end essentially meant that you have it mixed it in and the, your dish isn't warm enough for it to get kind of dissolved into the gravy that's about it and if you taste the actual sort of piece and then you think oh no this is spices are wrong uh, and so on it's about texture really more than uh, aroma uh, at all right uh, and so that is uh, one common misconception you don't need to cook spices you you uh, and especially spice powders they are pre roasted so to to extract more oil you dry roast them that's why when you make sambar powder you dry roast sun dry etc etc you 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 activate you get a lot more of the essential oils if you dry roast uh, the spices mm. spice powders are all pre dry roasted uh, so they don't need any cooking at all and best added right at the very end so mm. that's um we have two more topics before we take some audience questions sure. which which i have um one is um uh, you know in context of garlic and onion cooking um you know i want to talk about the miad reaction um uh, the browning so um what is what is a miad reaction and wh- how is that different from caramelization so these are two separate reactions although sometimes terminologically we sometimes use uh them interchangeably people will see caramelized yeah. onion they actually mean onion that has undergone miad reaction because caramelization is something that happens only to sugars at a very high temperature Right. uh so you so if you melt sugar uh, in a pan you at some point of time it will turn brown and brown. that's what we call sort of you know caramel and so on right so that's caramelization that's caramelization mm-hmm. right uh maillard reaction is a series of very complex reactions that happens between proteins and carbohydrates uh, amino acids basically amino acids and sugars in your food mm-hmm. uh to produce a fantastic range of very aromatic molecules uh and uh, it's a sequence that happens starts from 110 celsius all the way to 170 and at the higher end it can produce some very nasty smelling things also you can kind of know borderline burnt acrid uh, food is essentially the maillard reaction kind of gone rogue right uh, mm-hmm. but for most part the uh, like think about it right the magic of something like bread is that you th- you think about the fact that the floor your wheat floor is tasteless okay it's bland it has no flavor it's just powder okay you take salt you get water and that's all you need the yeast is already there in the air uh mm. it will ferment uh and it will it will leaven the bread uh the yeast will actually eat a lot of the carbohydrates generate alcohol and a ton of other byproducts uh and carbon dioxide uh and then you put the bread inside right the exterior gets first dehydrated uh so once the exterior dehydrates the maillard reaction happens in the oven uh and wheat is 15% protein or you know depending on what kind of wheat you use you know uh, and so on those proteins will react with the carbohydrates in the in the wheat itself uh to produce a range of those brown colors that's the surface crust of the bread and that quintessential smell of a bakery right 
that mm. those that smell of a bakery is literally the prod byproducts of the the Bayard reaction, right? So there are furanones and furanals and a bunch of these uh, molecules, each of which have one has one molecule is literally the smell of a bakery. So in fact, if you synthesize that molecule separately in your chemistry lab and just sprinkle it around your home, your home will smell like a bakery, right? So it is literally that. And so there is then there is the toasty smell and there is the slightly more sulfurous, meaty sort of smell, whole range of smells uh, that you aromas that you get from uh, from this sort of uh, reaction, right? You know, even with cabbage, if you cook it long enough, uh, because cabbage is so much water. So it, yeah. you need to make it lose enough water to, the, to to actually sort of get start getting brown. You won't believe it's cabbage. Did I? I mean, I used to think cabbage is like cow fodder, right? It's like completely you're tasteless. And uh, as we were growing up, you know, parents would make things like cabbages more regularly than others, and you know, nobody yeah. liked it, right? And and if you boil cabbage, it it smells bad as well, right? Because of hydrogen sulfide gas that the cabbage mm -hmm. releases. But if you really get it really slow cook, it takes thirty to forty minutes, right? It, it is fantastic. Uh, same thing with onions as well. You have for it, it has to lose a lot of the water and then start undergoing the Bayard reaction. It starts to get uh, brown and it produces a tremendous range of flavors. Uh, caramelization is essentially what happens. You can caramelize, you can technically even caramelize onions by heat, by really going down to the point where it literally turns into a jam. At that point, mm. the onion actually tastes sweet, completely sweet. Mm. Right? All you're left with is the sugars. Everything else is gone. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, right. so people do make like onion jam, uh, and it's you know it's really nice you know on burgers and things like that. So this mm -hmm. is uh, what it is. And so remember that when you're deep frying something, you are doing a high speed version of the Bayard reaction Bayard along reaction. with dehydration mm -hmm. in a very rapid amount of time. When you're sautéing onions, you're doing the slow version of it or, or, over time. Incidentally, you can even do Bayard reaction in the pressure cooker because the temperature is 121, so which is higher than 110. Uh, right. But you, it won't happen if you have too much water. Um, so mm. you can actually make a fantastic use of the Bayard reaction uh, by taking carrots uh, and then taking butter, generous amounts of butter. All you need is butter and carrots. Put it in the pressure cooker, no water, Fats. and pressure mm. cook for eight or 10 minutes. Uh, because now the cooking temperature is 121, the carrots will caramelize. The butter is there to prevent the carrots from touching the metal directly so that they don't burn, right? Uh, mm. And butter has like 15% water. So, you know, you're covered and carrot is 88% water. Okay, anyway. Water. So the carrot will come, undergo the Maillard reaction and turn slightly darker brown. And then all you literally have to do is add salt and blend it. And it will turn into a carrot soup unlike anything you've ever had because you, you wouldn't believe this carrot has all of this flavor once you actually happen to brown it, right? Uh, mm. And we normally don't. We don't. It takes a lot of time to yeah. brown a carrot, but you can pressure brown uh, a carrot uh, sort of this way. You can do that with beetroot also. So you make like, so mm. the other thing, you don't need any other ingredients. So to make a tomato soup, you need garlic, you need onion powder, you need a bunch of other flavors to actually get the tomato soup flavor. Carrot soup, all you need is carrot and butter and that's it. Uh, but if mm. you, but just boiling carrots won't get you that flavor. You'll need to sort of- uh, right. Um, and uh, you know, to add to that, why is that we add uh, garlic after we cook onions? Why why don't we add them together? Percentage of water. So onions are uh, almost eighty eight percent, much higher, ninety percent water. I think. Water. Uh, garlic is only I think uh, sixty percent water or something like that. I think uh, mm -hmm. so. Uh, therefore, an onion is will will quicker burn uh, than an onion. Uh, mm. Sorry, a garlic will burn quicker garlic uh, than an onion. Yeah. So you first, so what you're doing is you sort of let the onions sweat a bit uh, and then you add the garlic and then your timing is exactly right. So this sort of, you know, understanding these water percentages also helps you time when to put what. Obviously mm. people know this intuitively, right? Your pumpkin right. will quick cook quicker than, that the, That a pumpkin cooks quicker than a carrot is it something that all cooks know, right? Yeah. Because you know the pumpkin is water. But, mm. right. but, you're, but you sometimes don't think of it in terms of garlic and onion. You, you know, right. But a garlic actually has very little, very, very little water. Yeah. Mm. And um, I want to move on to this uh, new flavor that you were talking about, or at least new to some parts of us in, 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 in India, maybe, uh, the umami flavor. Uh, so what are some uh, foods that we find them in, or is it like, is it something that's added? Uh, what exactly is that? Yeah. So umami as a taste, uh, so it turns out we have taste buds for umami. So we have five tastes, right? So salt, sour, mm -hmm. bitter, uh, sweet, and umami, right? Mm -hmm. uh, umami is one of the most recent taste uh, buds uh, we've discovered, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, we still don't entirely know why exactly we have it. Uh, 
we have salt because our body needs sodium to survive right, right. so saltiness is literally your tongue's ability to detect sodium and and so we we like food with salt because our body needs sodium right, right. but uh, a small amount not too much right so otherwise you know it has heart implications so we have sweet taste buds because sweet is energy we are addicted to it because you know okay. it's instant energy glucose and sucrose so we so we have a sweet uh, taste bud we have a sour we have a sourness taste bud for to detect acids, acids. right mm-hmm. uh, acids are again important so basically sourness taste buds is literally the detection of hydrogen ions literally the detection of protons free protons essentially right that's what sourness detection is we have bitter taste buds to detect poisons uh, because most poisons mm-hmm. tend to be alkaloids and alkaloids tend to be bitter uh, that's why we have a protection layer uh, so that we don't ingest uh, things that may be poisonous. Too much and that's why the bitter taste buds, most of them uh, tend to be at the back of your uh, uh, tongue and not at the front of your tongue, uh, which is why bitter is the last taste you will detect. You will detect sweet, salt, sour first, mm-hmm. and then only you will detect uh, taste. That's why the English expression bitter after taste. So mm-hmm. it's you get all the things, then you kind of, and it's the last line of defense to prevent you from ingesting anything that's poisonous. You know? So that's basically mm-hmm. it. So now the currently accepted sort of uh, uh, hypothesis is that we have umami taste buds uh, so that we develop a taste for protein. Okay. Now remember that mankind uh, prior to the invention of fire and cooking for most of our history, uh, the, we ate only one thing. We only ate raw meat, right? We killed animals and we ate them. Right? That's essentially how a lion or a tiger uh, eats today, right? It's literally, you look at the animal kingdom, that's how, you know, carnivores and we are carnivores and that's exactly what we did for most of our evolution till we discovered fire and agriculture and the fact that, by the way, you know, uh, hunting and eating is, you can only support a small population, but you grow a crop, you can grow plants, you know, you can, you know, your population is suddenly exploded. So, so that, so a lot of our history has to do with the fact that we, we were hunter gatherers, mostly eating raw meat, right? Now, the problem is that raw meat is, is, uh, is not nice tasting, right? Uh, and so, therefore, we have evolved uh, uh, umami taste buds to detect proteins in general. So, glutamate. So, mm-hmm. we still don't know why only glutamates because glutamic acid is not even an essential amino acid. Okay? Right. Our body can actually synthesize glutamate. So, we still don't know, but mm-hmm. this is currently the accepted sort of idea that umaminess is essentially a taste for meaty sort of flavors. Okay, So, that's primarily mm-hmm. so that you are able to enjoy and eat more protein and therefore grow big and evolutionary, you know, that's the evolutionary reason and so on, right? So, you, so th- this is uh, one of the things. So in the context of uh, Indian cooking, uh, I think uh, uh, because there tends to be in some sense a, uh, shall we say, that a cultural sort of uh, uh, distinction, if you will, only in India between vegetarian eating and non-vegetarian eating. I think we're only the only part of the world that uses the term non-vegetarian. As in like, mm-hmm. the, they use a term to describe the eating habits of the majority of the population based on what a minority of the population does not eat. So this is very unique. It has to do with, you know, privilege and the fact that this is in the top of the food chain uh, and so on. But long story short, uh, uh, you take something like, say, a Japanese cuisine. It's very based on umami, right? So if you have foods that are high in umami and meat tends to be high on umami and certain ingredients tend to be very high on umami, seaweed tends to be high on umami, fish tends to be high on umami, right? So what I would say is that in the context of Indian cooking, uh, seafood, and uh, shall we say minimalist rural side meat kind of cooking is very much a very umami centric kind of cuisine. It's just a very vegetarian dominated, spice dominated way of urban cooking it does not focus much on umami because we focus on aromas and flavors and all the rest of those things. So umami is not as important. In fact, so uh, the protein that we eat does not have to be tasty. I mean, it is it's just a, it's just functional, right? You know, from paneer to whatever it is, it does not have that much flavor at all. Whereas, um, depending on how you cook it, et cetera, and what kind of fish you use, et cetera, in fact, the, the smaller and cheaper the fish, the more umami it is, right? But it's also smellier, uh, which is what the smell of the fish market is. But the taste is actually much, much more savory and lingering and because it really hits those umami taste buds and so on. Um, and so in that sense, I think, you know, uh, the other thing is fermentation is another thing that produces uh, umami flavors, right? Classic mm-hmm. example is idli, okay? Urad dal proteins um, along, uh, along with rice, right? Um, you ferment it. Uh, the, the, the fermentation reaction actually produces a lot of compounds that give you the umami taste, which is why we, we truly enjoy idli. Uh, and we, re- oh, the flavor of idli is, is 
despite its simplicity, immensely addictive because of the fact it has a bit of that umami sort of this thing. Tomatoes are a natural source of glutamates again, uh, a very rich source. In fact, the more you concentrate a tomato, the more umami it's actually going to get. And so, which mm -hmm. is why tomatoes are used all over Indian cooking, right? So it's another source right. of umami. Uh, but obviously, I think, you know, we don't, uh, for some reason, we don't seem to use seaweed as much, uh, uh, whereas Japanese and Korean cuisine uses seaweed extensively, right. very, very high on umami. In fact, mm -hmm. they just have the dried seaweed sheets, uh, right. just like how we yeah. have curry leaves and all that, and they just drop it into water, and you get yeah. a broth that is good to, and because it's already salty, it's just good salty. to eat as a soup, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, not high on nutrition, but tremendously tasty, right? Yeah. Uh, and so in that sense, I think, you know, it's just a question of uh, not having... Uh, focused on that because of our focus on spices, right? When you're adding 15 spices to a dish, on top of that, umami is overkill. Okay, got it. Uh, moving to the last topic, um, I wanted to use this, uh, you know, to talk about uh, uh, the foods that we have. Uh, you know, they say uh, these are these are I would say a little more modern. And uh, let me just get the one of the names. Yeah. Um, they're modern ingredients, but and because of which there's a lot of fit around them. Um, so, you know, first would be the, for, you know, one thing that tops the list would be MSGs, the monosodium glutamates. And then uh, we also have sodium citrate, xanthan, xanthan gum, and gum, soy yeah. lecithin. Yes. So yeah. I, I myself have seen this and, uh, and, you know, the first thing is you see a bunch of chemical names and you're like, oh, okay, maybe that's a lot of preservative, but you don't want to, yeah. you know, consume it. Yeah. I've seen that in a lot of these uh, ready-made, uh, sauces that we get like a Thai sauce or like a pasta sauce. I, I, I see all Absolutely. of, I see this in all of these. Um, yeah. So is it, are they harmful or like you said, anything in good moderation and what are the advantages of like, why do they add them to these kind of uh, sauces? So clearly I think uh, sometimes the uh, first bit is obviously chemicals. Yeah. All, all food is chemical. Okay? Right. right. Uh, so let's be certain, right? So you don't get to say, Sodium chloride is not chemical, but sodium bicarbonate right. is chemical. There are chemicals mm -hmm. in that sense of the word. Right. Uh, the second, uh, I think uh, uh, this thing is, I think sometimes our idea of modernist or new fancy untested ingredients has always been there. It's natural. You know, food is right. something that's very deeply personal and it's literally the only foreign object we put into our bodies. And so uh, for good reasons, we are careful about what new things we eat because we don't know whether it's going to have any long-term yeah. consequences. And sometimes the impact of what you eat you may not you may not see it immediately it may precipitate years later decades later uh, in other you know could be heart problems or cancer and things like that so yeah. it's not surprising that people are wearing so uh, in in that sense i don't want to sort of you know look down on people who are superstitious about what they eat uh, it's i think the most deeply personal joys in that sense and so in that sense i think you know if people do not want to eat msg i think it's fine uh, the only thing is that uh, the misconception around uh, running a campaign saying that, no, no, we must ban it, it is completely bad, etc., and prevent other people from eating it is, is a problem with me. I think we should all be allowed to eat what we want to eat, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Regardless of, uh, as long as it's not, you're not eating an endangered species, you must be allowed right. to eat what you what you want to eat, right? And it's, food is deeply personal. So, and the, the second idea of modernism, right? Uh, this is fascinating story of how uh, tomatoes were introduced uh, to Europe, right? So, you know, tomatoes, as we all know, were discovered in South America. Uh, before the 15th century, the rest of the world did not know of this thing called a tomato. Uh, but pretty quickly, I think it became, you know, globally a staple, right? I mean, it's literally in every mm -hmm. dish, in every cuisine, okay? So it's, uh, right. it's become like a universal thing, right? Uh, obviously, ginger and garlic have been used everywhere all over, uh, to uh, largely as, a, as an antibacterial, right? So essentially, any gravy, meat gravy cooked with garlic uh, in an unrefrigerated environment will last longer than something cooked without garlic because garlic is antibacterial, antifungal and so on, right? So tomatoes, on the other hand, uh, were introduced to Europe only in the 15th century, right? And one, they saw that the leaves looked exactly like the nightshade plant and they said, no, no we're not going to eat it because this is probably poisonous. Okay? Poison. That's number one. For 200 years, the Europeans did not eat uh, tomatoes. And for another reason, the royal families, on the other hand, they were like, oh, you know what, we want to try this new thing that came from the Americas, you know, we are rich and we want to try new things and so on, I want the novelty. Uh, and so they would, they were the first to actually try tomatoes. What ended up happening is that in those days, they used to use plates and cooking vessels made of pewter, pewters uh, made of lead. Okay. lead. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and European cooking his, did not use any acids at all till then, so it was largely okay. Tomato is sour. Tomato is naturally acidic. 
That's the date. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so when you cook tomatoes in a lead-based vessel, it's going to leach the lead, right, into your food. Okay. So it ended up killing a lot of really princes and rich people okay, in the first few years once tomatoes arrived. And so pretty much they said, okay, this is a complete poison. So this is a poisonous fruit. For 200 years, tomatoes were not consumed because they were thought to be poisonous. Only when they switched out, away from pewter and started uh, making other vessels with other materials, uh, stainless steel, cast iron, and so on, is when they realized that it's actually, okay, not bad at all. And it's actually tremendously tasty and so on, right? So, you know, you so, so the people who are kind of arguing against, say, a sodium citrate or a, or a whatever it is today, is that is the same category of people who are arguing against tomatoes, you know, uh, 200 years ago or 300 years ago. And so this, so this uncertainty and this sort of resistance to new things is always going to be there. Um, right. And in some sense, I think, yes, it's always good to be in moderation um, and, and really see uh, what effect it has, right? So think about the food industry does not want to add preservatives to harm you, right? They want to add preservatives because without it, there is just no product. Okay? Mm. Uh, you, you're, you're better off buying a product that has a high shelf life than a product that will pick up a nasty salmonella or a fungal infection that will literally harm you much worse than the effects of having a tiny amount of uh, uh, preservative, which by the way, you know, uh, we don't, you know, there is even no evidence of that. Okay, so sodium citrate is a preservative used literally uh, most commonly, right? What is citrate? Citrate mm -hmm. is the salt of a citric acid, That's right? It, yeah. What are you getting when you're squeezing a lemon? You're getting Lemons. citric acid. It's exactly the same thing. It's literally lemon juice. It's a sodium salt of that. And sodium is there in salt, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is, in small quantity, sodium citrate is, is not harmful at all. It's just salt. So, salt. Monosodium glutamate. Yeah, it's another salt, right? It's actually called sour salt, by the way. Sodium mm -hmm. citrate is actually called sour salt because the citrate part actually gives you the sourness and the sodium part gives you the salt part. Monosodium glutamate is also salty. It's called Chinese salt or whatever it is. The, the other part is glutamate, which is it's a salt of a glutamic acid, which is an amino acid. And we have two kgs of that in our body, right? And likewise, mm -hmm. uh, sodium is again uh, still there, right? And because of its umami uh, uh, sort of uh, this thing, it makes, it amplifies and makes all other tastes linger. Incidentally, if you're on a low salt diet, a tiny pinch of MSG will allow you to eat food with less actual salt. Mm. So you can actually argue that if you are on a low sodium diet, you should use more umami in your food because it will allow you to enjoy less salty food. Japanese yeah. food is not very salty at all. Oh, interesting. Right? But it is tremendously uh, flavorful because of the fact that it has so much glutamate. Most of it, obviously, you know, from seaweed and, you know, broth and all of those other things. But yes, uh, so that's essentially. So it, it's about, I think a lot of these modernist ingredients, you really have to ask yourself, what is its function? Uh, and, and at the end of the day, if you think its function is not as important to you, the utility is not as important to you, then don't eat it. It's not a big deal at all, right? right. I mean, so again, you know, you, you can use sodium citrate to make your own cheese slices at home, right? Uh, from mm -hmm. good cheese, as opposed to the really bad cheese that gets made into processed cheese. Uh, you can make your own uh, because it's an emulsifier, right? Uh, right. Likewise, sodium bisulfite or any of, any of these things, right? So at the end of the day, I mean, uh, all food is chemicals. Uh, I mean, understand what it does and why it does it. And remember that, you know, tons of people uh, in laboratories, etc., have a vested interest in making sure it doesn't kill you because then they don't have right. a customer. Yeah. So right. uh, it's, it's sort of, it's good to be skeptical. It's good to question the science. It, it's good right. to question corporate uh, greed. It's good to question, uh, you know, profit-making tendencies and so on. But I think, you know, you can equally take it to ridiculous uh, levels as well. I think that's, you know, that doesn't help anyone. Right. Um, before we get onto the questions, um, you've dedicated a whole chapter to this, um, you know, your favorite, I would say, um, you know, you describe it as an apotheosis of uh, craft in the kitchen. That's biryani. Uh, what, why do you think it's, you know, people are crazy about it? Like, why is that every, I mean, and there's so many varieties across India and, you know, across yeah. other parts of the world. Everybody has their own style of making it. So why do you think, what is the craze behind this? Um, you know, I this mean, at a very thing? elemental basic level, um, it's, a, it's a dish that combines the, the subcontinent's most eaten grain carbohydrate source and the subcontinent's most eaten protein source, uh, right. be it whatever it is. It's typically either, you know, chicken or mutton, but chicken, yeah, these are the most common sort of protein sources. 
or 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 vegetable protein sources if you so choose to make it either either way so at the end of the day you know so our, uh, typically we need a meal that is 50% carbohydrates 30% protein and 20% fat is is like the rough guideline of what's called a balanced meal right uh, and i'm just sort of talking about the spread of these uh, macronutrients micronutrients yes you need vitamins and all those other things uh, yeah. the amount whether it's 1000 calories or 2000 calories is up to you uh, but this sort of rough mix is what you need as uh, is considered to be a rough balance uh, in that sense right and so the way we cook our plan our meals historically has been to make sure that we kind of have this balance uh, sometimes uh, uh, some very restrictive vegetarian diets in india are very low in protein um uh, i i i, mean, I, I definitely I, they people believe that they're getting a lot of protein from uh, dal but they're not uh but they do have to sort of augment they might have to add a lot more so i you know the amount of sambar we add to uh, amount of dal we add to sambar sometimes is not enough uh, you need okay. to add a lot more uh, to actually for it to be balanced in that sense but again and all of these are again you know as i said rough guidelines if you will right so therefore if you think of it elementally that way uh, a biryani is a one pot dish that is a full b you don't need anything right. else okay. yes, exactly it's everything right it is it is it is carbohydrate it's protein it's fat it's spices i mean it's it's all there okay uh, uh and again if you add uh, sort of you know herbs and all these other things you've got your fiber covered as well, for most part right uh and so there this is this is one right uh and at a, uh, and at another level uh it is it is also uh the sub, you know sort of you know, sublime use of every sophisticated cooking technique uh to cook the rice perfectly to make sure that right. the protein is not overcooked and you get all of the infusion of the spices and aromas uh and to do it in a way where you can just make it and do other things right it's you mm-hmm. don't have to babysit it right so this is important because in a country where you know women literally slave in the kitchen all day uh multitasking poor basically. people have to eat every day uh the fact that you can make this giant batch of biryani in the morning and you can feed a family or by the way a, a guy running a shop can feed his customers whole day by cooking right. only once One is dish. a tremendous thing right imagine i mean if you're making alu parathas and you're selling it in a shop back breaking labor five right. people you need in a, in a in a this thing it's not practical at all right yeah. uh, i can actually argue for example idli on the other hand you have a batter you can be selling idlis all day all so day. there are certain yeah. dishes that naturally lend themselves to being popular amongst the masses simply because yeah. they're easy to produce easy to mass mm-hmm. produce right and be balanced right um and so there's clearly you know idli and biryani are all classic examples of this right uh, and the third aspect is also the the overarching history and the culture of how this is a very much a fusion dish the idea of uh, this this pulao biryani i think came from the came from the what is today persia uh, mm-hmm. uh so it wasn't right. it wasn't how we essentially cooked uh, uh, rice here at all and dried combined rice right. and meat it was always separate and so on and so that idea came from there but we've made it our own right uh, so the 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 equivalents of these pulao and biryani is there don't have as many flavors uh mm-hmm. and and incidentally the 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 original persian recipe or there is a i think akbar uh, in uh, there's a book written during akbar's time with the recipes of the biryani that was served to akbar mm-hmm. uh, uh it it has rice dal also it has rice dal oh. and beet right okay. because akbar uh because akbar bizarrely enough was famously vegetarian for most of his uh, adult life okay uh funnily you know the the, the, the rajput yeah. guy he defeated prithviraj chauhan was famously heavy duty meat eater akbar was mostly vegetarian um uh, mm-hmm. so interesting thing so his biryani actually had dal as well so and less chicken more dal right so rice dal okay. and a little bit of meat right Vegetable. so what is interesting is that uh, the uh, uh so mm-hmm. one is that it is it while it came from the outside it has been adopted adapted and made right. into local variations in every single part of india so right. it feeds the poor it feeds the middle class it feeds the rich it is economical to make it's a one pot dish it saves you time um, right. and in that sense i think you know i can't think of another dish that is truly universal in this sense and and it kind of bears out um, you know as i say you know swiggy and zomato and corn biryani is the single most sold item in india every single day Right, and right. literally to thousands every second or something. You know, there's some statistics. Right. There. So there is, right. you know, in that sense, it is well and truly the universal uh, uh, dish uh, in a sense. Right. Uh, so now we want to. I want to move on to the audience questions. Um, these were some of the questions. Uh, like some of them didn't know why they do it, and some of them were like, "Is it true that you know we have to do it?" The first question is: uh, uh, Every time we add turmeric to our food. 
uh, why are we asked to add a little bit of pepper? Is it for digestive reasons or, I mean, is it even no true reason. that there's no reason? Okay. There's, there's no published reason why you need to do that. Turmeric, again, for, for most part is, uh, uh, for most part, we use it to add color to our food. Color. Like powder turmeric, mm -hmm. right? Any and all uh, benefits of the curcumin, etc., are better off you using the fresh uh, turmeric, which is right. which can be a bit which which is not easy to get all the time, and also it can also be a little bit bitter. So, right. uh, so if you're using like so, you know, for example, Thai cooking and Vietnamese and uh, you know Malaysian cooking, uh, they use the the actual root, the um, far more common. So what they end up doing is that they take the root, uh, and then they use a, a galangal, which is a which is similar to ginger. Uh, mm -hmm. So they use garlic and turmeric along with shallots uh, and lime leaves uh, and garlic to create and chilies to create a paste. And they make large batches of this paste and all their cooking will start by taking a bit of the paste, frying it in oil and then adding other things. So that's right. how all your Thai curries, you know, Malaysian curries, etc. Mm -hmm. Very similar to Indian cooking styles. The only distinction right. is that instead of ginger, they use galangal, which is very similar to ginger, but slightly sort of more lemony, less spicy uh, note. And okay. uh, it also counters the bitterness of the turmeric uh, and the turmeric lends mm -hmm. the yellow color uh, as well. Right? right. So in yeah. India, we use dried powdered uh, sort of turmeric. Uh, turmeric, yeah. The processing actually, you know, if at all you're thinking of any health benefits, the processing is going to remove uh, any and all of those things in any case. Right. Mm. So it's right. best to think of the, the tiny one quarter teaspoon you're using as, as a way to get the yellow color. Right. right. Uh, we find that pleasurable and that's really about it. Uh, if you want the benefits of turmeric, do what Tamil people do, apply it on your face. You uh, actually eat the raw thing or, or, the, or, the, the or boil the whole thing with milk. And, you know, that's when you want any health benefits, you do that. Uh, the turmeric powder right. is not going to give you any benefits. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we add he as a fortida to our uh, cooking. So is, is it, when do we add it? Like, do we add it to a tadka, the tempering, or do we add it to the food when we're cooking? What's the no, you add it to the oil almost always. Uh, but asafoetida is such a strong spice. Again, it depends on the quality you buy. Uh, mm -hmm. Most asafoetida you buy is upwards of 70% uh, maida. Okay. Because asafoetida is such a concentrated spice that it has to be diluted with maida. So what you actually mm -hmm. get is a, so in the South India, it's rice flour. In North India, it's maida. Okay. So that's what we use. Okay. So the asafoetida you get is mostly just rice flour or maida. Okay. It's only a small portion of it is the actual spice, which is very, very, very strong smelling. Intense, uh, right, right. In fact, the, the word literally means devil's dung. Okay, so as a feted, <laughs> feted, right? So it literally oh, means yeah, devil's right. dung. I mean, yeah, that's mm. the literal. Uh, so, uh, so it's a very strong spice. So in that sense, uh, if you add too much of it to the oil, the dish will be overpowered. So adding a powder to the liquid, like we might do in rasam and so on, will get you a milder flavor, which is which which may be right. what you want, right? Because mm -hmm. the uh, the overpowering smell of that spice is actually very is not nice at all, um, and and so in that sense, right? And asafoetida essentially became popular in India around the time when it was it became uh, when onions and garlic suddenly got were demoted to uh, tamasic status, right? So mm -hmm. not not sattvic and so on. Um, and so therefore uh, people, but those are addictive flavors, right? So we have to cheat. So let's find another spice that has similar sulfurous flavor molecules, but at least I can say it's not tamasic. So, you know, sometimes some of the, all of these, mm. you know, so sometimes, you know, our addiction to food uh, makes it very flexibly easy for us to ignore whatever religious dictates that may be there, right? Which may not be very well informed for most part, but I think, you know, asafoetida, is literally a replacement for onion and garlic. It has very similar flavor molecules and it gives you a similar oniony smell and flavor uh, right. in your food. So yeah, that's why actually a lot of uh, Jains, a lot of uh, uh, people who do not eat onion and garlic will be huge consumers of asafoetida. Ah, interesting. Um, and uh, the last question in terms of, um, you know, the science or uh, to cooking is, uh, you know, when you're cooking gravy, we add oil, and uh, we've been told to wait until the oil comes up, the, you know, the, the the surface, and then we switch it or the, uh, switch the gas off, and that's when we know the food is done. Uh, so why is that? Like, why do we have to wait till the oil reaches the surface? Right. So essentially, uh, in a sense, when you when you what you're actually doing is that you. Um, you start with oil, spices, and then you add water, some kind of water, gravy, tomatoes, whatever. Right? So it's a watery gravy. And then you're sort of, you know, it's so it becomes a fat water emulsion of some kind, right? And then the goal is to, uh, what you're actually trying to say is try to figure out a milestone where it's easy to tell the person that I think you should be done by now, right? Uh, and one way of communicating that milestone is when you believe that the gravy has lost enough water. Uh, 
to the point where the oil now becomes visible that's really what mm. it is it's a dehydration milestone right, right? so then you say hey, okay i think you know that's a, that's a good milestone it's better than saying 8 minutes or 10 minutes which is arbitrary right. Right? so mm. it's a, it's just a it's an interesting milestone More visual. Uh, right it's a visual milestone that's easy for people to instantly see right so you see the oil simply because most of the water is gone now that's really what it is right okay that's interesting um coming to my last question uh this is more of uh, you know from a writing point of view um how was the whole experience of you know writing a book as an engineer like you know um as someone i'm um, i'm guessing this is the first this is your first book i mean i know you've you've done a lot of writing you know for blogs and you know for for the you know for uh, mint lounge and all that but um, as a first time uh, writer for a book and you know the whole process of publishing so there were some of my friends who were interested you know who who are new authors and they wanted to know what are the hassle and what are some hacks that you know or or some tricks that they can learn as a first time um, author and as a first time uh, publisher how easy that would be i think one is you know uh uh clearly writing a book uh, because you you at the very least you need to be thinking about say 60000 words right, right. Uh, which is a lot mm-hmm. right so a column is like a thousand words right uh and this is 60 times that um so right. one is you have to uh, and therefore the second thing you have to think about is uh, you have to as much think about what you want to cover and what you don't want to cover uh so that actually makes it easier for you to focus on the things that you most useful things that you want to say uh and then comes the things related to uh the the style and tone of writing um is it you know in the early days i thought i'll i'll, I'll target the same kind of audience that likes reading my blog you know humor and snark and uh, uh you know like the engineer who understands science looking down on people who don't understand science or are superstitious mm-hmm. and pretty 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 quickly my editor said no don't do that i think uh, uh don't talk down to people um so i think it's uh, write something that is able to explain uh science using ideas from you know high school Simple. as much as possible yeah. right uh, yes yes um and i think it it will reach a wider audience and in the retrospect that was right. good advice i think the book is selling well again because i'm not talking down to people um uh, and and also you know she also said you know okay cut down I, as much as i love the chennai references and jokes keep them minimal because uh somebody you know forget It's for it, you know, somebody from agra may not understand what what jokes you're making and so on um, right. so keep it reasonably minimal or universal as much as possible right uh and then the other uh, thing is also about uh Uh, understand your audience you know who you're writing for right um and uh, and respect them and and sort of you know uh you have to keep the information density at the level where it's not too much and it's not too low either right, uh, right. so your question is you know if you're writing i think you're writing fiction and writing non fiction are very 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 separate things uh right. fiction is a is a, is needs a it's it needs an entirely different muscle uh the the way you tell a story the way you capture attention and so on imagination definitely some of those definitely some of those practices are useful when you when you do science communication at least right, uh, right. Uh, because you know at the end of the day you know so you're writing a scientific white paper or an academic white paper uh, th- there is a very certain uh, rigid discipline about uh, the terminology you use there's no room for jokes there's no room for generalized points and so on you really have to stick to exactly what you say and you have to constantly keep uh, clarifying what conditions don't apply right Uh, under right. what under what conditions this is true right so part of the problem why science is inaccessible to people is because it's hard for people to read white papers it's only meant for other scientists right. to read and peer review and so on but yeah right. but uh, simplifying that in some sense for a, a, a lay, lay person's audience means that you do have to sort of pick up some narrative uh, storytelling uh, sort of methods of how to capture an attention and you know quickly surprise people and and where to use humor uh, and, and and so on and last but not least i think you also need a you need a habit uh you got to you know, literally say fine you know 3000 words a day 2000 words a day whatever it is uh, mm. and and just stick with it uh, uh i used a tool called scrivener that naturally sort of sends me reminders every day and shows me a graph of okay you wrote 5000 words today but only 1000 words yesterday and so it kind of keeps you uh, honest about uh, your productivity uh, don't don't write before you first do your table of contents and the the uh, sub chapters because then you can just go okay and then don't write it linearly right write what what you feel like writing on that day so always right. get the table of contents out and then go you know today i feel like writing about facts why because yesterday i just made something and I, it's all fresh in my mind so i'm going to write about it because it's easier for me to do uh 
uh, I didn't want to write about garlic because uh, uh, I had it used it uh, and so on. So it's not fresh in my mind. I have to ref refresh and read a little bit more before I write. Uh, and make notes. I mean, if you're writing 60,000 words, you need to have like 200,000 uh, words of notes uh, right, right. from which you will then, it's easy. I think the digital tools allow you to create rough drafts and then reread and reread and reread as opposed to the traditional typewriter model of or handwritten model of writing where it was important for you to do all the stuff and then kind of get the draft down because it's painful to keep doing it again and again. But in a digital way, you, you're, you're better off actually sort of uh, writing really badly at first, but getting it out and then right. fine-tuning yeah. it, fine-tuning it. The more number of times you read, more critical you get uh, right. and so on. Right? So that's what I would say. That, uh, you know, is, is and how really did you... And, yeah, go no, go ahead, go ahead. How no, did no, you no, how no. did you market it? Uh, like how like I I see that you uh, you actually talk to your audience on Twitter. Um, so you know besides that, what are the other tools that you that you used for marketing? See, I think in today's world, so publishing is a is a tough industry to be, right. uh, and it's right. you know pretty obvious that uh, the fact that I I have a day job and so on, and I I would never think of uh, publishing being my primary uh, uh, career right. at all. Is, is, is really reflects on the state of uh, the publishing industry. Uh, uh, at least in the context of India, a very tiny number of, a single digit number of authors uh, can make a career out of writing. Writing. Uh, at least books. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could be a journalist, you could you could be, do all these other things that also involve writing, but uh, or a technical writer working for corporates and all that. But pure play, writing, fiction, nonfiction, single digit number of authors who can actually make a series, any kind of serious career out of it, at least right. something that pays as much as a good job in say technology or engineering and so on, right? So, um, I mean, in, in that sense, the uh, uh, the way things work right now is that uh, you have to market your book. Companies do not have any kind of budget uh, right. or the marketing skills in a social media world uh, right. to market your books. They are, they are learning, but for most part, you really think about it, right? I mean, all of the, the marketing technologies that are now central to marketing all came in the last 10 years. Companies have not had time to really work that out. Some do, but most, remember publishing is a very old industry. It's one of the oldest industries, right. 500 years old since the printing press. And right. the historical way to think about books has always been bookstores and literature fests uh, and things like that. That's And, and right. in, in some sense, they still inhabit that world. And the pandemic has not made uh, it any easier. Uh, mm -hmm. No bookstores, no lit fests, and so on. Right, right. So it, it, you're relying entirely on your personal capital as an author uh, to be able to uh, bring your audience. Communicate. Uh, I, yeah. In fact, I would argue that the decision for a publishing company to award a contract to someone is predicated on the person having an audience in the first place, not having writing skills in the first place. Mm. You have audience and you have writing skills. That's what I want. But audience is important. Right. So. Unless you're like sort of exceptional uh, and so on, uh, for most part, the average person writing is going to be someone who probably already has a following on social media. Um, mm -hmm. And so therefore, in essence, can sell five to 6,000 copies is the definition of break even, right? I mean, if you can, if, if you have an, if you have enough of a network to push 5,000, 6,000 copies, it makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the basic calculus of essentially writing uh, fiction or nonfiction uh, uh, at this point, right? Obviously, there are now, uh, there are other interesting sort of avenues, you know, people are definitely now thinking about how I write, I can write for film, I can write for, uh, I can write straight to a TV series on Netflix, or I can write a book and then approach Netflix or Amazon Prime and have sort of have them buy the rights to that. The, right. uh, the integration of these sort of multimedia formats uh, built on uh, writing is definitely there. Uh, yeah. But that, that's being the, that's being driven by those companies rather than the publishing companies themselves. Right? Oh. Uh, so I would actually think this is, um, you know, uh, this brings us to the end of the, you know, our, our conversation. It was, it was really informative and uh, I hope the audience actually, I want the audience to go back and read the book because there are, I, <laughs> I barely scratched the surface and uh, there are a lot more like, you know, especially I love the, uh, the, the portions where you spoke about how a microwave oven works and the concept of air fryer. I wanted to talk in depth, but then I think we're already running out of time and I don't want to keep you uh, for a longer time. So I would um, recommend all of you to go, uh, please go and read a Masala Lab. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I'll 
to put up the link of that in the description and uh, do check out some of his tunes on uh, SoundCloud for a cornucopia of music and uh, parodies. So uh, thank you very much Ashok for your time. It was uh, wonderful talking to you and uh, uh, Smriti couldn't uh, you know, continue joining uh, us. She had someone come there, so she had to drop out. Um, so it was great having you uh, on our podcast. I, and I hope uh, our audience uh, understand the, you know, what, what is food science and all these you know, simple questions that we have when we start cooking. And, uh, um, and I would uh, also recommend them to go check out the algorithms that Ashok has given in the book, because if you, if you really want to uh, understand, if you want to pick up cooking as a hobby, or if you just want to try, these algorithms will give you a simple way to actually start cooking. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, please um, like, share and subscribe our content. And we have interesting content coming up in our future weeks. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Well, thank you. Absolute pleasure.